Today, you're going to learn 50 phrasal verbs that native speakers actually use. Of course, I'm Jennifer, and welcome back to J4's English Training, your place to become a fluent, confident English speaker. And in this lesson, you're first going to watch a group of 10 phrasal verbs, and then you're going to complete a quiz to make sure you know how to use those phrasal verbs, and then we'll continue on with the next group. So you're also going to complete five quizzes in this lesson. Let's get started. Number one, to come around to an opinion or an idea. And this means to change your opinion or to see a new point of view. Now notice the sentence structure because we have two prepositions, around and to, and then after to, we need something. We need a noun, an opinion or an idea. For example, I came around to the new job after I heard about the benefits package. So remember, this means you changed your opinion. So previously, you didn't want the new job, but now you've come around to it. So you've changed your opinion. Now you want the new job because you heard about the benefits package. We commonly use this without the preposition to and without specifying the something when the something has already been mentioned. For example, at first I didn't want to move to Boston, but I came around after I visited. So notice, I didn't say I came around to something because the something had already been mentioned. So I came around to the idea after I visited. Number two, to get across a point or a message. And this is when you clearly and effectively communicate a point or a message. For example, make sure you get across that the project is over budget. So if you're having a meeting with a client and your boss has this very particular message or idea, the project is over budget, and your boss wants you to communicate that in a clear, effective way. Your boss wants to make sure you get that across. Now we also use this when you're talking, you're talking, you're talking, and the ideas aren't really coming out very well, and after a while, you stop and you say, what I'm trying to get across is, and then you state your point. What I'm trying to get across is, the project is over budget. Number three, to show off. This is when you deliberately display your skills or abilities in a way to impress other people. Now this is frequently used in the negative, don't show off, don't show off. But there's definitely a time and a place when you want to show off. For example, when you're going to a job interview, you shouldn't be modest. You should show off your skills and abilities. You should talk about all your awards, your accomplishments, your degrees, the compliments you've received. You want to show off all of your experience to the interviewer. So an interview is the perfect time to show off. Also, if you're going for your IELTS exam, you don't want to be modest with your knowledge of the English language. You want to show off your abilities by using a range of grammatical structures and a range of phrasal verbs and idioms and expressions. You want to show off to the interviewer. Number four, to count on. Now this is exactly the same as to rely on or to depend on. So you have three different phrasal verbs all with on that mean the exact same thing. And this is of course when you trust someone or something to complete a specific task or objective. For example, I can always count on Selma to stay late. 
So you can trust Selma to complete the specific task or objective, which is to stay late. And remember, you could replace this with rely on. I can always rely on Selma or depend on. I can always depend on Selma. Now we frequently use this in a question response. For example, can I count on you? Can I count on you to close the deal? And then you can reply back and say, absolutely, you can count on me. Number five, to come between. Now this is when something disturbs a relationship. And that relationship can be a professional relationship, a social relationship, romantic, family relationship. It can be any kind of relationship. For example, Jacob and Marcus were best friends until Sylvie came between them. So that's the image you could have. They were close, Jacob and Marcus, but then Sylvie came between them and now they're divided. Sylvie disturbed their relationship. Now it's very common for a girl or a guy to come between a relationship, but it doesn't have to be a person. It could be that Jacob and Marcus were very close, but the promotion came between them. The new job came between them. Their family came between them. Their politics came between them. Their religion came between them. It could be anything came between them. Money is a good one as well that comes between people in relationships. And remember, you can use this in any type of relationship. Number six, to put up with something or someone. And notice this is a two preposition phrasal verb, put up with, put up with. And we use this to say that you tolerate bad behavior or unwanted behavior to put up with. For example, I don't know how you put up with your boss. I don't know how you tolerate your boss. Now, of course, we can be more specific and specify the action that the boss does. I don't know how you put up with your boss's constant criticism, for example, or your boss's distasteful jokes, for example. I don't know how you tolerate it. Now, we commonly use this to say, I'm not going to put up with, and then the behavior. I'm not going to put up with your constant criticism any longer. Number seven, to bounce back. Now, to bounce back, this is when you recover or recuperate. Now you can use this when you recover from a negative situation in a business context, like for example, a bad sales quarter or a bad product launch, for example, but it can also be when you recover or recuperate from an illness. So you can use it in both those situations. For example, in a workplace situation, you could say, I don't know how we'll bounce back from our loss in Q2. So I don't know how we'll recover. And then you could have a discussion. How can we bounce back? Does anyone have any ideas on how we can bounce back? Now, in terms of recovering or recuperating from an illness, you could say, it took me a while to bounce back after my surgery. So it took me a while to recover, recuperate. Number eight, to act up. This means to behave badly or strangely. This is very commonly used with parents describing the actions of their young children or even their older children. My son keeps acting up, behaving badly. But we can also use this with devices and objects. For example, my computer keeps acting up, behaving strangely. My computer keeps acting up. I hope it doesn't break. Number nine, to make it up to someone. 
This is quite a long one, so pay attention to this sentence structure. To make it up to someone. Now we use this when you try to compensate for a wrongdoing. For example, let's say it's your best friend's birthday and you can't go for whatever reason. So this is the wrongdoing, not going to your best friend's birthday party. Now if you want to compensate for that wrongdoing, you could say, I'm so sorry I can't make your birthday party. I promise I'll make it up to you. I'll make it up to you by taking you out for a nice dinner. I'll make it up to you by going to the movies with you. I'll make it up to you by buying you a really nice present. So those are the ways you're going to compensate. Now you might be wondering, what is this it? The make it up to someone? We use it with it because what you're trying to compensate for has already been explained, so you don't have to say it again. Now you can use this in a business context. Let's say you went over budget on a client's project and you might say to your team, how are we going to make it up to the client? How are we going to compensate for our wrongdoing? The wrongdoing is you went over budget. And then maybe someone would suggest we can make it up to them by offering a discount or offering a free product, offering an extra service. So those are how you're going to compensate for the wrongdoing, to make it up to someone. Number 10, to barge in. When you barge in, you enter a place, a location unexpectedly, and you interrupt whatever's taking place. For example, I was in my office working and this kid just barged in and handed me his CV, but later I hired him. So by saying the kid barged in, it implies that he didn't have an appointment, he wasn't expected, he just barged in unexpectedly and he interrupted whatever I was working on. But in this case, it was successful because he got the job. So now you have the first group, so let's complete your quiz. Here are the questions for the quiz. You need to complete each sentence using the correct phrasal verb. So go ahead and hit pause now and complete the quiz. Here are the correct answers. Go ahead and hit pause and see how well you did. So make sure you share your score in the comments and now let's continue with your second group of phrasal verbs. Number one, to abide by. This is more of a formal phrasal verb because it's used when you accept or follow a rule or regulation. So we use it mainly with government rules, court rules, even business rules as well. For example, as a tourist, you have to abide by the rules of the country you're visiting. So if you see a sign that says no parking, you have to abide by that rule. You have to follow that rule. Now remember, we also use this to say you simply accept. You accept, but then you follow it. For example, let's say you go to court because of a dispute and the court doesn't rule in your favor, you still have to abide by that decision. You have to accept it and then follow it. So this is a more formal phrasal verb, but it's very useful because we all have to abide by many different rules, regulations, and policies. Number two, to dawn on. This is an excellent phrasal verb to add to your daily vocabulary. To dawn on is when you finally realize or understand something. For example, one day it just dawned on me that I need to change careers. So one day I just realized 
I need to change career. So you can absolutely say realize, we're just using the phrasal verb dawn on and it's extremely common. Now, notice the sentence structure here. It dawned on me. Something dawns on someone. So the it is the realization. It dawned on me that I need to change careers. So just keep that in mind because the sentence structure is commonly used with it dawns on and then someone. Number three, to pull off. This is also a must know phrasal verb. When you pull something off, you're able to do something that is difficult or unlikely to do. For example, let's say you're a wedding planner and a couple comes to you and tells you they want to have this huge 300 person wedding in three weeks and they want you to plan everything. That's really difficult and it might even be unlikely that you're able to plan a 300 person wedding in three weeks. So you could say, I don't know if I can pull that off. I don't know if I can do that because it's very difficult. I don't know if I can pull that off. The that being planning the 300 person wedding. Now let's say you do successfully plan the wedding after you could say, I can't believe I pulled that off. I can't believe I pulled off planning a 300 person wedding in only three weeks. Number four, to back out of. This is an excellent business phrasal verb. It's used when you fail to keep a commitment or a promise. Now in a business context, a commitment could be something you agree to or arrange to. It can be formal and you have a contract in place or it could be more informal and you just agree to it verbally. So if you don't keep that commitment, then you back out of it. For example, I can't believe the client backed out at the last minute. Now notice here, I just said backed out. I didn't use the of. We only use the of when you specify the noun, the something. I can't believe the client backed out of the agreement, the project, the plan, the proposal at the last minute. Number five, to clam up. This is an excellent phrasal verb for all of you or anyone that does public speaking because when you clam up, you're unable to speak, usually because of fear or nervousness. But this can also be used if you simply refuse to speak for whatever reason. For example, I always clam up when I'm public speaking. When I'm public speaking, I become unable to get the words out. You clam up. Now my advice to you is if you feel like you're going to clam up, just take a deep breath. Number six, to mull over. When you mull something over, you think about it or you consider it. And the something you're mulling over is simply an idea, an idea, a proposal, a suggestion, and you mull it over, you think about it, you consider it. So let's say you're in a meeting and a client or colleague suggests a new tool to use and you need to think about it. So you could say, give me a few days to mull it over and I'll get back to you. To mull it over, the it being using the tool, purchasing the tool, whatever you're going to do. Give me a few days to mull it over. Now you can also specify the noun and you can say, I need to mull the deal over before I commit. Number seven, to pan out. This is an extremely common phrasal verb. To pan out simply talks about how a situation develops. For example, I'm not sure how this merger will pan out. So the situation here is the merger. 
And we're talking about, well, how's the merger going to go? How's it going to develop? Will it be positive? Will it be negative? Will there be challenges or difficulties, benefits? That's how the situation develops. So here I'm saying, I'm not sure. I'm not sure how the merger will pan out. Now let's say the merger has some difficulties or challenges. You could say the merger didn't pan out, didn't develop. The merger didn't pan out as we had expected. Number eight, to ramble on. This is an excellent one for all you public speakers because when you ramble on, you talk at length without getting to the point. So let's say I rambled on for five minutes trying to explain the definition of ramble on and at the end, you didn't understand it at all and you're confused, you're a little annoyed because I wasted your time, I rambled on. So this is used as a negative and it's used when you're communicating an idea. So we generally use this as a complaint. The speaker rambled on for 20 minutes. Number nine, to nod off. This is when you fall asleep, but is when you fall asleep usually for a very short period of time and usually when you're not supposed to. So this isn't when you go to bed at the end of the night, okay? So let's say you're in a meeting at work and your colleague is rambling on and the topic is very boring and you start doing this. That is nodding off. And this motion of your head, what I'm doing, this is the verb to nod, nod your head. So when you fall asleep, what do you do? You nod your head. So that's where this phrasal verb to nod off comes from. And remember, we use this for short periods of time, usually when you're not supposed to fall asleep. For example, when you're driving. So I might say, I always listen to loud music when I'm driving at night, so I don't nod off. And number 10, I love this phrasal verb, to luck out. When you luck out, you're very lucky in a specific situation. So let's say there's this major sale on the new iPhone model and they're selling for 50% off and you go to the store and you get the very last one. You could say, I can't believe I lucked out and got the new iPhone for 50% off. You lucked out. You were very lucky in this specific situation. Or let's say you're driving during rush hour and you're going to an appointment and you get a parking spot right in front of the office in rush hour, downtown. You can say, I can't believe I lucked out and got such an amazing parking spot. Or if you're telling that story to a friend, I got this parking spot right in front of the building downtown during rush hour. They could say, wow, you really lucked out. You really lucked out by getting that parking spot. Are you ready for your next quiz? Here are the questions. Hit pause and complete the quiz now. Here are the answers. Hit pause and compare your answers to the correct answers. So how'd you do? Share your score and let's continue on with your next group of phrasal verbs. Number one, to rip off. We use this when someone is selling something or buying something and the buyer feels that the price is too high compared to the value of whatever they're buying. For example, I can't believe I paid $200 for that. She ripped me off. Now notice the sentence structure. You rip 
someone off. She ripped me off. Another example, she told everyone that I ripped her off, but it was a fair price. So just because someone claims you ripped them off, it doesn't necessarily mean it's true. Number two, to wear out. We use this when something is damaged or weakened because of age, it's old, or because of use, you've used it a lot. For example, I wore out my tennis shoes last summer. If someone said that to me, I would assume they played a lot of tennis last summer. They played so much tennis that they wore out their shoes. They became damaged from use, from continually playing tennis. We also use this in an adjective form to be worn out out. So it would be very common to say, I need to buy new tennis shoes because mine are worn out. So of course are because shoes is plural and we need the plural form of the verb to be mine, my tennis shoes are worn out. So both forms are very common. Number three, to draw up. We use this when you need to prepare paperwork. And generally that paperwork is for a contract, an agreement, a proposal, generally something that two people need to sign or agree on to make it official. For example, I asked my lawyer to draw up the papers. Whenever you're dealing with a lawyer, the papers are going to be official. So this is a perfect time to use to draw up. Or you could say, we're waiting for our bank to draw up the mortgage agreement. So that's another very official document that you need to sign and you can use the phrasal verb to draw up. Number four, to burn out. This is a phrasal verb that has gotten a lot of attention recently, especially with the pandemic. Because to burn out, this is when you feel exhausted mentally or physically from prolonged stress. Stress of work, stress of a situation like a pandemic, stress of a family situation like a divorce or an illness, something like that, but a prolonged period. You can be stressed out for a day, but when you burn out, it means you've had that stress for a long period of time, several weeks, several months, or even several years. For example, I burned out at my last job. So perhaps I was working so much that I went through this period of prolonged stress. I burned out. Another example, I burned out after caring for my aging parents. So caregivers often experience burnout. So you can use this in a work situation or you can use it in a personal situation as well. Number five, to look up to someone. So notice we have two prepositions, look up to and then someone. We use this when you admire someone or you respect someone. So I could say, I looked up to him like a father. So of course I admire and respect my father and I'm comparing the situation to someone else. I looked up to him, I admired him like a father. Another example, I really look up to my boss. So you admire your boss, or you respect your boss, you hold your boss in high regard. So you can use this in a work situation, you can look up to people, and you can use this in a social situation, a family situation. You can have many different people in your life that you look up to for different reasons. Number six, to step up. Now that's the phrasal verb, but we most commonly use it in the expression to step it up. Notice that it, it's very important to step it up, to step it up. This simply means to work harder or to try harder. Now you can say we need to step it up 
if we're going to meet the deadline. So you have this deadline, you need to work harder. So it's the same as saying we need to work harder if we're going to meet the deadline. Step it up. Now what is this it in the expression? Well the it would represent work or effort. We need to step up our work. We need to step up our effort. Step it up. I encourage you to use it that way. Step it up because you'll sound like a native speaker. We have a really common expression with this, step it up, and then you add the two words a notch. Step it up a notch. If you look at a dial, a notch is one move on the dial. So it represents a little bit, a small amount. Step it up a notch. It's just like saying step it up a little bit. So that's just a common expression. You need to step it up a notch if you want to meet the deadline. So you can use it with a notch, it's very common, or you can use it without. Number seven, to hone in on. This is another two preposition phrasal verb. We have hone in on, hone in on something. And this means to really focus on something, to put all your attention on something specific. For example, if we want to get more customers, we should really hone in on small business owners. So maybe right now you're not being very specific and you're looking at all customers, but you want to hone in on one specific segment of the population, small business owners. So you're going to focus on them. You're going to hone in on them. Another example, for the presentation, we should really hone in on South America. So maybe you're a global company and you have branches all over the world, but for this specific presentation, you're going to hone in on one specific part of the world, South America. Number eight, this is a must know phrasal verb to bring up. And this is when you begin a discussion on a specific topic. For example, if you're in a staff meeting, it would be very common for the boss or whoever's leading the meeting to say, before we end the meeting, does anyone have anything to bring up? Does anyone have a specific topic they want to discuss? Does anyone have anything to bring up? Or after the meeting, you might tell another colleague, I didn't have a chance to bring up the marketing proposal. So you didn't have a chance to discuss this specific topic, the marketing proposal. Maybe you ran out of time. Number nine, to talk into. And the sentence structure is to talk someone into something. And this means to convince someone to do something. For example, she talked me into helping her move. She convinced me to help her move. So when someone uses this, oh, she talked me into helping her move, it gives you the impression that the person didn't really want to do the activity, but somebody convinced them. But please, I really need your help, I'll buy pizza. Or maybe you could say, my team talked me into bringing up the bonus at the staff meeting. So notice I use bring up, discuss a specific topic, the bonus. My team talked me into bringing up the bonus. Now, because maybe discussing the bonus is a little bit of a sensitive issue and nobody wants to do it, but your team convinced you, lucky you, <laughs> so they talked you into it. And number 10, to stick around. This is a must use phrasal verb. You can use it in a social setting or a professional setting. To stick around means to stay in a location for a period of time. So let's say you're at this beautiful park with a friend and after an hour or so, your friend has to leave and they say, do you wanna share an Uber? And you say, no, I'm gonna stick around a little bit longer. So you're going to stay in 
a specific location, the park, for a period of time. It's unknown how long you'll stay. That doesn't really matter. It's just the fact you're going to stay. I'm gonna stick around a little bit longer. It's such a beautiful day. I'm gonna stick around. Now you can also use this in the negative. I can't stick around very long because I have a meeting. Although it's a beautiful day, I can't stick around very long. I have a meeting to get back to. Are you ready for your next quiz? Here are the questions. Hit pause now, complete the quiz, and whenever you're ready, hit play, and I'll share the answers. So go ahead and hit pause now. Here are the answers. So hit pause, review the answers, and whenever you're ready, hit play and come back to the video. So of course, share your score and let's continue on. Number one, to take up. This means to occupy or to fill. Now, we use this specifically with two different nouns. You can take up time and you can take up space. And they're both very commonly used. For example, I could say, this meeting took up my whole morning. So it occupied or filled the amount of time. Now, we can also use this with space. For example, I need a new couch because my couch takes up too much space. So it occupies or fills space. So remember, you can use this with both time and space and they're both very commonly used. Number two, to branch out. Now this means to expand. And we use this specifically in a business context. So let's say you're in a meeting and you're discussing how to increase your profits. You might suggest branching out into new markets. So if you only sell in North America, you can branch out, expand, and sell in Europe or in Asia, Africa, for example. We need to branch out into new markets. Number three, this is a fun one, to jot down. Now you would probably understand this from context. In the meeting, I jotted down a few notes. I jotted down a few notes. So it's the exact same thing as write down. I wrote down a few notes, but it's very commonly used. So someone might ask you, maybe your boss or a colleague even, might say, hey, can you jot this down? And then they might give you a number or a date or a location and you write it down. Now, of course, not many people use pen and paper anymore, right? We take electronic notes. But if your colleague asks you to jot something down, you can absolutely take out your phone and make a note in your phone. Jot it down in your phone. Write it down in your phone. So this still applies even though we don't really use pen and paper much. Number four, to carry out. This means to perform or to conduct, and we use this specifically in a business context. For example, next week we're carrying out our customer surveys, our student surveys. We're carrying out our surveys. We're conducting them. We're performing them. So I'm just going to do the survey. That's the simplest way to say it. Next week we're doing the surveys. We're carrying out the surveys. Number five, this is an important one, so make sure you jot it down. Number five, to keep up with something. This means to make sufficient progress on. Let's say that you have this many orders and it's your job to fulfill those orders. If you fulfill this many, you've kept up with the orders. You've made sufficient progress. But if you fulfill this many, or this many, or this many, or anything less than the total number of orders, then you haven't 
kept up with the orders. You haven't made sufficient progress on. Now, of course, you can use this with many things other than orders. You can use it with your studies, your reading list, your chores, your performance reports, your filing, your scheduling. You can use it with many, many, many other tasks. Number six, to fill out or to fill in a form. Now, this is one that confuses a lot of students and they ask me, do I fill out a form? Do I fill in the form? What's the difference? The reality is there is no difference specifically when we're talking about a form. Now, when you have to fill out an application, you could also fill in an application. Fill out your passport renewal. You can fill in your passport renewal. In this specific context, there's no difference. Number seven, to drop in. This is a great phrasal verb because you can use it both in a business context or a social context. Now, to drop in simply means to visit. So, if you're talking to a friend and you're planning to visit that friend, you can say, how about I drop in Saturday morning? How about I visit Saturday morning? Now, in a business context, you might have a client that wants to drop in, that wants to visit, or you might drop in on a client just to say hello and to keep that relationship going. So you can use this in both a social and a business context. Number eight, to push back. This means to delay or postpone in the context of a scheduled event. So a scheduled event like a meeting. Let's say the meeting was scheduled for Monday, but everyone is really busy on Monday. Well then push the meeting back until Wednesday. Postpone it until Wednesday. Now you can use this in a social context. So you might be planning your wedding anniversary and it's your 10 year wedding anniversary. And the actual date is March 30th, but everyone is busy. So you might push it back until the middle of April so more people can attend. Well, everyone's busy, so let's push back the party until next week, until two weeks from now. So you can push back a scheduled event, which means to delay or postpone. Number nine, to call off. Now, this means to cancel a scheduled event. So remember in our last one, to push back, you delay or postpone. But the other alternative is simply to cancel it. But generally, when you call something off, it's because there were some problems or issues associated with it. But the problem or issue could be a scheduling conflict and just people couldn't attend. So let's say you were planning a conference for the summer, but nobody registered because everyone's really busy in the summer. So you might discuss it with your team and say, let's call off the conference. Attendance is too low, so let's call it off. Let's cancel it. Now you can also use this in a social context. You might call off your wedding, but if you canceled your wedding, then most likely there was a problem, an issue, a big one, right? So in that context, in a social event, most people will wonder what happened. Why did they call off their wedding? Why did they call off their anniversary? They're going to assume that something is wrong. And number 10, to sort out. This means to organize or to fix if there's a problem. For example, I need to sort out my travel plans. So it could mean I just need to organize them. So I need to decide when I'm going to travel, what airline I'm going to use, what hotel I'm going to use. 
I need to sort out my travel plans. But I can also use it if there's some sort of problem and I need to fix it. For example, my flight was cancelled, so I need to sort out my travel plans. I need to fix this problem with my plans. So to sort something out, you can organize it or you can fix it if there's a problem. Are you ready for your next quiz? So here are the questions. Hit pause and complete the quiz now. So here are the answers. So now let's review your final group of phrasal verbs. Number one, to tune out. This is a very useful phrasal verb because it's used to say you stop listening to someone, you stop paying attention to them because you don't like what they're saying basically. So you tune someone out. This is something that kids do all the time with their parents, right? If your parent is giving you advice and you don't wanna hear it, you just tune them out. So your parent is talking, but you're just not really listening. So you might say, I always tune out my mom when she gives me relationship advice. Now this can also happen a lot in a workplace situation. Let's say the coworker that sits beside you is just a very negative person and complains a lot. You might just simply tune them out. So you stop listening to them because you don't want to hear all that negativity and complaining. So you just tune them out. They're talking, but you're not listening. Number two, to tick off. This is a useful one because it means to annoy, to anger, or to irritate. Now we use this in two very specific sentence structures. It ticks someone off. It ticks me off when my coworker doesn't help. So it ticks someone off and then you explain the situation that causes the anger, the frustration, or the irritation. Now the other sentence structure is just to say someone or something ticks me off. John really ticks me off. He's so negative. John really irritates me, frustrates me, annoys me. John really ticks me off. He's so negative, but I just tune him out. Number three, to talk up. And you talk someone or something up. And that means you speak in a way that makes that someone or something sound really beneficial, really positive, really amazing, maybe even more so than the reality. So let's say you're in sales and you're trying to sell this piece of software to a company, well, you're going to talk up that software. You're going to talk about that software in a way that really highlights all of its positive features. And you probably won't mention any negative features. You're going to talk it up. Or let's say that your really close friend applied for a job in your company. Well, you're probably going to talk up your friend. You're going to speak about your friend very enthusiastically, very positively, because you want your friend to get the job. You're going to talk up your friend. Number four, to pile up. This means simply to increase in amount. And we generally use this with work. So in general, you could say work is really piling up. Work is increasing in amount. You can use this with specific work. So you might say my expense reports are piling up. Or even with household chores, you might say the laundry is piling up. The dirty dishes are piling up. They're increasing in amount. Number five, to mope around. To mope around, this is when someone moves from one location to another, but they do it in a very unhappy way, a lazy way, a disappointed way. And it's generally because something is wrong, something specific is wrong. So maybe they just lost their job or they just 
broke up with their girlfriend, so they mope around the house all day. They go from the couch to the kitchen, back to the couch, but they look really upset and lazy and no energy. So this isn't really a positive thing. We generally say stop moping around. You need to stop moping around and start looking for a job if that's the reason why you're moping around because you lost your job. Stop moping around and look for a job. Number six, to loosen up. This is a great one. It means to be more relaxed, more comfortable, or less serious. So you might say, she was very shy at first, but then she loosened up. So she became more relaxed, more comfortable. Now we often use this as advice to someone. If someone is just being too serious, you might say, loosen up, loosen up. It's similar to saying, relax a little, relax a little, loosen up. You need to loosen up. Oh, just loosen up. Number seven, to kick off. This is a great one because when you kick something off, it means you start. But we use this in the context of a sports event a meeting, a conference, or even a party. So some sort of event with people. So in sports, it's very common to say the game, the match kicks off at, and then you say the time. The match kicks off at three. The game kicks off at seven. And that's just when the game starts. Now you could also say, let's kick off the meeting by, and then you can explain how you're going to start the meeting. Let's kick off the meeting by introducing the new CFO, or let's kick off the meeting by sharing the good news. Number eight, this is a fun one, to horse around. When you horse around, you behave in a silly or noisy way. So basically, what children do all the time. They horse around. But you might say, the kids were horsing around and they broke my favorite vase. Now, although this is commonly used in children, it can of course be used for adults as well because adults act in silly and noisy ways all the time, right? Even in workplace context. So you might be talking about how your team is constantly horsing around. And as a bonus, you can also say goof around. It's an alternative, but they're both very commonly used. So horse around or goof around. Number nine, to get by. This is when you have just enough money to live on but not very much extra. So you can basically pay all your bills and that's about it. So you might say, since our twins were born, it's been more difficult to get by. You have two new babies in the house. Well, first congratulations, but of course that's very expensive. So now you only have enough money to pay your bills, to buy the food, buy the diapers, buy the groceries, pay your mortgage, things like that. We're getting by, we're getting by. You're just surviving. So if someone knows you're going through a tough time financially, maybe you lost your job and they ask you, how's it going? Is everything okay? You could say, well, I'm getting by, I'm getting by, which lets them know you're surviving. You have enough to pay all your core expenses. And finally, number 10, to flip out. Now this can mean to become very excited but it can also mean to become very angry or agitated. So it's when you have a very strong emotion, but that emotion can be positive excitement or it can be negative anger. And it will be obvious based on context. So if you just won a competition or a prize or the lottery, you might flip out and become very, very excited, right? The sports team flipped out when they won 
the gold medal. Or the team flipped out when they lost the game. The team became very angry. So you can use it in both situations. And for this expression, you can also say freak out. Freak out, flip out, they mean the same. And again, positive excitement or negative anger. Are you ready for your final quiz? So here are the questions. Of course, hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready, hit play, and I'll share the answers. So you can go ahead and hit pause now. Here are the answers. Go ahead and hit pause and figure out how you did. All right, you did it. 50 new phrasal verbs added to your vocabulary. Congratulations. Make sure you share your scores from all the quizzes in the comments below. And if you found this video helpful, please hit the like button, share it with your friends, and of course, subscribe. And before you go, make sure you head on over to my website, j4senglish.com, and download your free speaking guide. In this guide, I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. And until next time, happy studying.